way to our uh, second question out of section three. This is one of these change of basis problems, which students often find a little bit confusing and take a little bit of time to get their head around. I sort of like to think of this, I like to think of a lot of maths by analogy, so I like to, to, think, to, to think of an, an analogy here of uh, human beings. Human beings like to wear different clothes. Sometimes we dress in one particular way and sometimes we dress in a totally different set of clothes, but underneath we remain the same person. Matrices are a little bit like that. The actual linear map remains the same, but the way it's dressed up, that is its matrix representation, may change depending on the underlying bases that we're working with. So in this problem, we have a linear map. We're not told explicitly what it is, except we're given the matrix with respect to this basis. We've got some linear map from R squared to R squared. And if we use this as our, this funny basis B, as our basis for the domain and for the codomain, then this is the matrix representation of this linear map. And what we'd like to know is, well, what's the matrix representation for it? with respect back to the standard bases. Can we change it back and see what it looks like back with respect to the standard bases? Once we know that matrix, in fact, we can even write down a nice simple formula for this linear map. Whereas in this form, it's not so easy to see. So the question is, what is the matrix with respect to the standard basis? So to do these sorts of problems, I like to draw up what is commonly known in the trade as a commutative diagram which simply is a way of representing the information that we've got here and tells us uh, what, what we're looking for, which is the matrix N down here on the bottom. So at the mo moment, we have a linear map from R squared to R squared. There's its matrix and there's the bases we're working with, both sides. And we want to know, if I change the basis to the standard basis, what's the matrix down here? So in the diagram now, I'm going to add in these two what are called identity mappings. Now don't confuse identity map with identity matrix. They're not the same thing. So this one here is an identity map. It doesn't do anything. This is an identity map. It doesn't do anything either. It's an identity. It takes every object to itself. Now what we'd like to know is that if I'm using this basis here and that basis there, I need to know what's the matrix representation of this particular linear map. Well, it's actually easier to come over to the other side and look at the map down this way. In fact, in general, it's always easier to map from a funny basis into the standard basis. And I'll show you why that's, why that's true. It's very easy to get the matrix from here to here. Doing this directly, it's more fiddly to get the matrix from there to there directly. And the reason is that the identity map doesn't do anything. So I take the matrix one, take the vector one, three, under the identity map, what happens to it? Absolutely nothing. It becomes one, three. And now I need to get its coordinates with respect to this basis. Well, that's easy because to build this vector, I need one of those and three of those. So the coordinates of this vector, if I'm working with the standard basis, the coordinates of this vector are in fact just the vector itself. It's just the coordinates of this vector in the old sense. And remember to get the matrix representation for a linear map, you take the basis vectors of the space you start from, you get their images and you put the coordinates of this as the column. So that's really easy. Similarly, I take the vector 37. Under the identity map, what happens to it? Nothing. It stays the same. Its coordinates are 37 with respect to this basis, and so that becomes the second column. So that's really easy. So in fact, this these um, basis vectors here end up in this set, in this case, as just the columns of the matrix. I might just squeeze in, I might call that matrix P. Now, what's happening on the other side? Well, again, it's the identity map, except we're going back the other way. 
And so if the matrix from here to here is given by P, then the matrix simply going back the other way, the identity matrix, should be the inverse of this matrix. So over here, this is going to be the matrix P inverse. Finally then, to get the matrix M down here, we want to, we want to know what's the um, matrix representation for the linear map from there to there. And all we're going to do is take a detour. So we're going to go up here. That does nothing because it's the identity map. So to get the matrix M, I want to go up there. It doesn't change anything. It's not applying T. It's just the identity map. And so we apply the matrix P inverse. Then I'm going to go across from there to there. Well, that's when you're applying the linear map T, and that's its matrix representation. So that's the matrix A that does that. And then to go down here, well, that's just applying the map, the function, the matrix P, which again doesn't do anything because it's the identity function. It doesn't change anything. So going around here is exactly the same as doing nothing, apply T, do nothing. Only now, the matrix M is going to be represented with respect to the standard basis. Well, by the way, notice the order in which we write this down. It's not P inverse AP. You have to take your vector, apply P inverse, then apply A, then apply P. So note carefully the order. Think about what it's doing. Well, now finally I just go in and copy all the matrices in. So that's 1, 3, 3, 7. This is the matrix 4, 3, 2, 1. And the inverse, well, that's got determinant of minus 2. So I'll divide by the determinant. What do you do? You interchange those two, change the sign. And now you multiply all this out, which I'll leave you to check. And when I did the arithmetic on this, I got minus 26, in fact, um, 12, minus 67, and 31. So fairly complicated matrix back with respect to the standard um, bases.